If not, let me introduce our guest speaker. We're really grateful to have Devin Munker here with us today. Devin is a really great person for us to have here because Devin was one of you not too, too long ago. I don't know quite Devin's age, but he was, he graduated from BYU Hawaii uh, with a bachelor's degree in international business management and focused a lot on entrepreneurship. And if I'm correct, I think, you know, we also have business plan competitions. Devin actually won, was it two of them? Mm -hmm. Two of them and was considered entrepreneur of the year among his fellow students here in the program. He was very involved even during his schooling with several businesses. Uh, Dekine Auto Sales, I think was one, so selling cars while he was doing, helping him get through school. He started up uh, Dekine uh, Wireless System here. I think he later sold a good chunk of it, or most of it, but cell phones. Uh, he's been, I guess it'd be described as a serial entrepreneur. He started and been involved with several businesses. He's right now very involved in something that I was involved with a lot of my life, a lot of real estate work. He has two separate subdivisions that I think are going to one and that's not easy to do in Hawaii. I know having, I've done it in, in uh, many, many places, but it, from what I understand and see here in Hawaii, it's not simple. So we wish him the best of success in that. He served a full-time mission um, in Alaska right. and has been involved also with another fund the Mentor Venture Capital Fund. So Devin and some other people have actually helped some people like yourselves and other entrepreneurs in funding some of their business ventures. So in the fall and then in the spring, uh, or in the, the winter term, we have some business plan competitions. We'll tell you more about that, but we want you to be thinking, we hope that you're thinking of what am I going to do as I leave BYU Hawaii, what am I going to do to make a living? Come up with good creative business ideas to be an entrepreneur or to be innovative in whatever your field of work is. Both those things. We want you to think of that and be involved in our great ideas exchange in the fall and the business plan competition. And I think you couldn't get a better example than someone who's actually been there, done that in that area as well as now in other fields professionally. So. Welcome with me, Devin Monker. Thanks. Lost my little antenna here. Aloha. Aloha. Thanks for uh, the nice introduction, Brother Tanner. Really appreciate that. Hopefully we can use the technology and make it a productive day. Um, as Brother Tanner mentioned, my name is Devin Monker. Uh, I'm actually from Idle Falls, Idaho. Uh, came here to Hawaii back in 2001. Um, actually served my mission in Alaska, like he was saying, had some missionary buddies that were Filipinos that had gone to school here and then went on their mission to Alaska and just kept telling me how great of a place it was. And, and they convinced me, you know, to at least come for a semester. So I thought, you know what, can't, can't hurt to come for a semester. And during that semester, I had a lot of great experiences. I fell in love with the university, with the mission of the university. Um, I fell in love with a, a beautiful girl. Um, in fact, I, I just got to put a little plug in for home teaching because it works. <laughs> <laughs> I know because my first semester here, I met my beautiful wife here. She, uh, I was assigned to her and her roommates. And I'll tell you what, it was not hard to make sure that monthly visit uh, took place. In fact, uh, weekly, then it became weekly visits and daily visits and, uh, you know, had 100% home teaching every single month. And so I got to put a little plug in for home teaching. Make sure you do it, brother, because you never know who you're going to be home teaching. <clears throat> uh, since we've been married, uh, we got married in 2004. Uh, we have a small little family. You can see my kids there. We have three little monkeys. They are wild. They are full of life. Uh, a little too full sometimes. They keep us extremely busy. That's that's actually my, my main business is chasing kids around. <laughs> um, you know, I've always kind of been an entrepreneur throughout my life. You know, as far back as I can remember, I've always been kind of, I've considered myself a wheeler and a dealer. I've always got something for sale, always trying to make a buck, it seems like. In fact, uh, the way I met my best friend when I was a kid, um, I was sitting on the steps of the elementary school trying to sell my BB gun. And uh, I met this kid and he bought it from me and we've been best friends ever since. And all through junior high and high school, I, you know, I've always had something for sale, it seems like. I've just always kind of had that drive to, to do deals. And so it's been, it's been a lot of fun. 
Um, and as I mentioned, you know, I graduated here in 2004 and uh, I hit the ground running. Ever since then, I just got into business. And so let me tell you about a few of the, a few of the ventures that I've done. As Brother Tanner mentioned, um, I started uh, Dekine Auto Sales. Or something on here. I'll tell you that one later. <laughs> uh, Dekine Wireless is one that I've started recently. You guys probably know that here in Laie. If you can't tell, I, I kind of like yellow. I, all my logos look the same. I also got into some DVD rental businesses, you know, kind of like the red box. Mine was called the yellow box. Um, and I did a few different ventures in there. I had a company in, in Idaho that we did at Sunshine Family Movies where we did edited movies. Uh, I have one, like I say, at TVA. And then I've sold off the rest, so we're not really in that business anymore. Um, something that I, I'm focusing most of my time on nowadays is this company called Global Ventures. And uh, this company I've done a lot of different uh, real estate ventures in. I've done you know, foreclosures, I've done um, some subdivisions. Uh, I have one in Kahuku right now we're trying to do and then one up by Sacred Falls in, in Punalu that we're trying to do. And had some great experiences doing that. Uh, the other business that I spend a lot of my time in is a company called Ali'i Estates. This is a new company. We started about uh, about a year ago, and uh, it's been a great business. I love doing it. Um, what it is is we manage luxury properties, luxury vacation rentals. Let me show you some pictures of, of things that we're managing right now. If you can believe it or not, this property is right here at Melakahana, and we have several more just like it, and it's been a great, great business. It's fun to be able to manage these properties, to deal with the type of clientele that comes in to stay in these properties. These cost several thousand a night, so you don't just get your average vacationer coming in. It's usually you know, big executives or celebrities. Uh, in fact, after the Green Bay Packers won the Super Bowl, we had several of their players come and rent the house, so it was kind of fun to entertain them for a week. i uh, show you some more pictures of the place here. Very beautiful property. So that's been a really fun business and I've really enjoyed doing it. Um, to start off, I, I guess uh, I feel a little inadequate you know, in speaking to you today because I'm, I'm not a very seasoned businessman. You know? So I've got to kind of put that disclaimer out that you know, I'm, I'm no different than you guys. You know? I mean, it's only been a few years ago that I was sitting in your class. In fact, I remember sitting in Brother Two's accounting class. You know? It really has not been that long. You know, it's only been, uh, it's like I say, since 2004. And I remember coming here to the lecture series and, and hearing speakers. And now I, I'm kind of surprised I'm even up here because I don't really feel worthy. You know, you should be hearing from Brother Tanner and Brother and Sister Johnson, you know, these people that are really seasoned in business. And, but although I hope that I can share a few things with you guys that I've learned over the last few years, that I've been able to leave BYU Hawaii and I've been able to go out and try some of the principles that I've learned while I study here. And so that's my goal today is to be able to share some of those things with you. Um, let me just kind of start off by, um, I'm just going to list a few suggestions uh, to kind of get you started in your business venture. So if you want to note these down, that'd be great. Uh, the first thing I would suggest that you do is that you find your passion. Um, I, I think this is so important because it seems like in today's world, people, they do things for the wrong reasons. They do things for money or for, because their neighbor's doing it and they see that their neighbor's, what do they call it, keeping up with the Joneses. You know, they're, they're, they're successful in a business or in a job and so they decide to do the same thing. And I, I really, I've really found that's just not the way to do it. Like, I would rather be poor but do something that I'm happy than be rich and be stuck in a miserable job or a business that I don't really love to do. And so, Find what you're passionate about. Find what you love to do. Find what's going to get you out of, out of bed in the morning. Uh, you've got to be driven. Uh, let, let me give you a little quick example of that. Uh, my wife, amazing girl, she went to school here as well, graduated in 2003. She studied computer science. She hates computer science. <laughs> she, uh, when she came here to school in 1999, computer science was a very hot field. There was lots of jobs that were being offered in computer science. And coming from the Philippines, her family encouraged her to study something that she could easily get a job in. So she came here and she studied computer science. And it was a great thing for her because she learned how to work hard. I mean, it's probably one of the hardest majors here at the university. So she learned how to work really hard, but throughout her major, she didn't really enjoy it. It wasn't very exciting for her. Even though she worked very hard and was very successful in it, it wasn't what she was passionate about. Um, after graduation, fortunately, she's continued her education. She's learned a lot more um, things like uh, elementary education and culinary arts and photography. And she's, she's broadened her horizons in things that she's more interested in. But if I asked her to do a program for me, I wouldn't get the time of day. She never, the most computer that stuff she does is photo stuff. And it's just because she found that 
that's not her passion, although she did take something out of it. So, you know, really think about your majors. Think about what you're studying and why you're studying it. Are you taking uh, science classes because you know doctors make a lot of money, but you don't really enjoy it? Um, so think about those things. Make sure you do something that you love. Uh, the next point I want to bring up is don't let anything stand in your way. Um, once you find your passion, go for it. Be aggressive with it and make it happen. I mean, you're going to apply this to your business ventures in the future anyway. You know, that's what entrepreneurs do. They, they find ways to make things happen. If it was easy, then everybody would be doing it. Um, but a lot of times it's not easy. You have to be aggressive and you have to find ways to make things happen. Um, and, and along with that, you kind of have to be creative too. Let me share a little example with you. Uh, when I was going to school here, I saw that there was a need. Um, students, there was not a lot of opportunities to buy good cars here on campus. This is back before the days of Craigslist, and now it's pretty easy to find a good deal on a car. But when I was going to school here, all they had was a big board in the Aloha Center and a few little junk cars listed on it. And so if you wanted to buy a car, you didn't have a lot of options. So I saw there was a need. I went out and I tried to find where I could get good deals on cars. I found that uh, up in Honolulu, the Kidney Foundation had a lot of donations every week that they sold through the auto auction. Well, in order to buy from the auto auction, you have to have a Hawaii dealer's license. And I researched how to get one and found that it was just not possible. It was just, it was very difficult and I couldn't read the requirements. You know, most people, they would just push it aside and move on to the next business venture. You know, they said, oh, I can't do it, I'm gonna move on. I didn't, I kept looking and kept researching. I, I just knew there had to be a way I could buy those cars and make this business work. And, and by the way, the business was called Luxury Motors. Well, there was nothing luxury about it. <laughs> All the cars I ever sold were North Shore Cruiser Junkers, but I liked the name and so that's what I did. <laughs> Anyways, long story short, I found that in Alaska, you can get a dealer's license very easily. No problem, to one application, boom, you get a dealer's license. With that license, you can buy at any auction in the country. All the auctions require is that you have a dealer's license. They don't care what state it's from, just as long as you have a dealer's license. And so I was able to get my dealer's license and started selling cars. It was great. The point is, I had to be creative. You know, I, I, could, I didn't let those first couple barriers stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I had to be creative. I had to research more and find ways around it and find ways to make the business work. And it was successful. I sold a lot of cars. It put me through school for a lot of years. Um, you know, many of you may not even be looking to become entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe some of you uh, want to get a job in a different field. Maybe you guys want to be an accountant or um, want to be an executive or, or whatever it may be. And so you're going to be focusing on getting jobs. Well, in today's job market, it's hard to get jobs. There's a ton of competition, isn't there? Um, so one suggestion I'd give you to be creative and to get aggressive, to make yourself stand out for your employers is to do something that I learned from this guy named George Gillette. I, I was actually in a forum just like this. When I, right when I go for my mission, I went up to BYU-Idaho for a semester, and I sat in a forum just like this, and this CEO of this company, uh, he owned football teams and ski resorts and stuff, and he got up there and he said, if you want to get a job and you don't want to mess around with all the competition, he's like, you just go straight to the CEO. You know, Brother Tanner, you were a CEO of a big company. If, if somebody came to you and, and got through your secretary, got past your secretary and said, hey, Richard Tanner, I love your company. You guys are doing great things. They knew about your company and they had suggestions of how they could help your company. What are the chances of them getting a job within your organization compared to somebody that just submitted a resume? Huge. Huge. The fact that they got to you shows that they can make things happen, right? Because CEOs aren't easy to get to, right? So that's, that's a big thing and that's always stuck to me over the years. Like if you want something, you know, sometimes you don't want to mess around with, you know, the normal system of getting it. Sometimes you just got to go right to the top. You know, and uh, is, it's not easy to do that. He gave some suggestions, and I'll just kind of point those out to you real quick. You know, he said, uh, you know, if you can't get past the secretary and actually talk to him on the phone, send your resume and a cover letter, FedEx signature required, overnight air priority to the CEO. Is he going to get it? Good idea. Yeah, because they've got a sign for it, and it's urgent, and so they're going to they're going to look at it and read it. Now maybe he's a busy guy, and he's not going to have time to call you back. But it's his obligation to pass that down to human resources. Okay, if you're a re human resources director and the CEO hands you a resume and say, "Hey, I got this in the mail. Take care of it," are you likely to to call that person and make an interview with them? Yeah, you're going to want to make your boss happy, and this came from your boss. So think about that. I want you to write that down because I think that's good advice. I've had the opportunity to do that a little bit um, 
in, in, in some of my business ventures, you know, just bypassing, you know, the different people within an organization and just going right to the top. It doesn't have to be just for a job, but if you want to get a deal done or a partnership or you need something from an organization, go right to the top. Be aggressive. Be creative. Uh, the next point. Don't let money determine your happiness. Um, I think this is really important. Uh, you know, nowadays it seems like money really drives people's happiness. When they have money, they're happy. When they're losing money, they're not happy. Uh, if you know anybody that does uh, day trading, <laughs> sometimes uh, they, they can be up and down. It's like a roller coaster with them. You know, if the market's down, they're in a bad mood. If the market's up, they're in a good mood. And so the next suggestion to you is just don't let it determine your happiness. You know, find your happiness in your family and those things that are truly important. And just know that money is just there to help others. You know, have, do it for the right reason. Uh, I, I like to think of, uh, you guys ever heard the saying, sufficient for your needs? We hear that in the church sometimes. I think it's important that we, we earn enough that's sufficient for our needs and then use the rest of it to bless the lives of others. And so that we don't increase our lifestyles just because we make a lot more money. And, and get to a point to where money controls our happiness. Because a lot of times, we're gonna lose. And I think losing money and having failures in business is an important part of growing and becoming seasoned. Uh, there's a great talk uh, by Hubie Brown. In fact, this is another thing to write down. It's called God is the Gardener. You know, go home and, and look, up that, look up that talk. In fact, maybe I think there should be a question on your thing if they read that talk, because that's a powerful talk about why our Heavenly Father lets us fail in things and why we have failures, because it really does build your character and it makes you a more seasoned businessman and an entrepreneur. In fact, I was talking to a, a good friend of mine on, what was that? It's a good story, sorry. Yeah, it's a, it's a great one. Uh, in, in fact, I was talking to a good friend of mine the other day. Uh, his name's Eddie Hassan. He's one of these real estate lecture guys that travels the country and teaches lectures. And uh, he was telling me that he gets asked by his students all the time, you know, Eddie, what, what makes a seasoned businessman? What makes a seasoned entrepreneur? And he said, my answer is the same every time. He said, a seasoned entrepreneur or a seasoned investor has lost everything, has lost a lot of money, and has failed in a lot of ventures. And, and I think that's so true. There's just something that you learn from failure that you don't get from successes. Would you agree, Brother Tanner? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a huge part of it. Um, you know, I, I don't like I was saying earlier, I don't know that I'm, I'm very seasoned yet, but I, I have lost a lot, so, and I've had a lot of failure. So maybe I'm getting there. Maybe a few more, and I'll be up here with these guys. Um, in fact, uh, I always kind of get scolded by my wife because when I do have failures and I do have some losses, I always just kind of blow it off. Oh, honey, it's just a school of hard knocks, just my tuition fee. And she doesn't seem to think it's too funny. She's like, you put us at risk too much. You're too aggressive. <laughs> but I'm just like, hey, that's just the way it goes. That's just the, my mentality and the way we got to do things. Um, kind of along with that, you know, going back to what's really important is it's your family. You know, it really is your family that's important in life. Uh, I love that. I love the quote that uh, by David O. McKay that says, uh, "Oops, that no success can compensate for failure in the home." And so, you know, I think that needs to be a number one priority in business is your family, and and don't let money ever take that over. Focus on your family. Spend quality time with your wife and kids, and you'll be successful. Uh, my last or my second to last point here is start now. Uh, a lot of times, we think that. You know, we've got to have, there's this myth out there that you've got to have financing to start a business. Or, you know, I'll start when I graduate college. Or uh, another one I hear all the time is, oh, I'll, I'll serve the Lord when, I, when I'm retired and I go on a mission. Um, well, I'm here to tell you, you can start now. You know, even in college, I started several businesses. These are some little companies that I started, little clothing companies that I tried to make happen. I eventually turned my, my car business into a company called Campus Cruisers. And uh, there's no reason why you can't start now. Even if you're not going to go out and start a business today, get involved in the business plan competition. Get involved in the great idea exchange. Start thinking about what you want to do when you graduate. Start writing business plans. Start researching it. Uh, another thing I would do is I would build your network. You know, you guys are here in this amazing university. You have professionals. Brother Tanner was a CEO of a, a huge corporation that went public. You know. Where else do you get to hang out with guys like this? Brother Johnson, what, what did you do for your career? Build power plants. Build power plants. I mean, the guy is amazing in construction. He knows the ins and outs of all these types of things. 
And when you go to the entrepreneur uh, lecture series, you're going to have other professionals come in and talk to you. When you go to the business plan competition and the, and the entrepreneur conference, you're going to have businessmen from all over the world that have huge successes in different fields come in and talk to you guys. Take advantage of that. Get their business card. Get their contact information. And keep in contact with them because these guys are here to help you be successful. They will answer your phone call. They will talk to you. They will put you in contact with other people who can help you. I know because I've done it. You know, that's all I did when I was here at BYU Hawaii is build my network, develop these relationships. And I can, I can honestly say that the majority of the deals that I have done have involved my BYU network in one form or fashion. Whether it was calling them to get mentor advice from them. I've had uh, these entrepreneurs that come for the conference every year. I've had them fund real estate deals with me and be my partners. I've had one uh, bought one of my businesses from me. I mean, it's been great. And, and I would have never got that if I didn't come to BYU Hawaii. And, and ask and talk and be bold and just say, hey, you know, can you, can you help me? Will you, will you mentor me in this business? I have, a, I have a good friend. You might see him driving up and down the Cam Highway. He's got this big white beard. His name's Eric Kaihui. And uh, he, his nickname is The Producer. I love that. Um, and he always tells me this. If you don't ask, you don't know. So just ask, you know, if you, don't, if you don't get up and get bold and say, hey, can I get your business card? Can I keep in contact with you? Can I ask you questions? Can, will you invest in my deal? You have nothing to lose by doing it. Just go for it. Uh, my last point here, um, what it's all about, why, we, why we're involved in this and, and what the point in all this is. Um, when I was a student here, I had this great professor. His name is Brian Carrington. He was just a volunteer here for a few years, kind of like these brethren here. Uh, brother too, you probably remember Brian Carrington. Very successful guy. And uh, at the time, we were trying to start an entrepreneur club. And I'm, I'm not sure if there still is one here or not, but when I, was, when I was going to school here, we had an entrepreneur club. And I remember sending him an email one time, and I said, Brother Carrington, what do, what do you think a good name for our club would be? I want something that stands out, something that has meaning behind it. And I was pretty blown away by his response. And I've, oh, I've, I've kept this for years, and I've shared it with a lot of people because it really inspires me to know why, what, what is the point of being an entrepreneur? And I think he sums it up right here. It's titled, Brigham Would Go. He says, apparently there was a famous surfer on the island that would go after big waves. A slogan emerged after his name, Eddie Would Go. Today around the island, or so I'm told, surfers will often look doubtlessly after big waves and cry, Eddie Would Go, meaning let's go for it. What if we were to use that theme, but give us some history and context with the real Brigham Young? Brigham Young is my ideal of a consummate entrepreneur. Not only did he build hundreds of businesses, he built hundreds of communities in a land where no one else thought it could be done. He brought into a land of desolation all of the following. Religion, morals, values, education, elementary through university, economic development, sufficient to sustain basic needs, food, water, shelter, and much more, health care, government, law and order, culture, music, arts, literature, and theater, all the elements of a sustainable community. Brigham followed the Lord and built Zion out of nothing. Magnificent buildings, profound art, advanced education, all swelled up out of the most desolate parts of the country. And all this next to a sea poisoned with salt. Oh, that a Brigham would emerge in the Philippines. Oh, that one would move into Cambodia. What if Brigham were called to mainland China? Brigham and Tonga would build a model society. This is what we need to do. It's not about making money. It's about leading the church. It's about returning to our target countries and building Zion, sometimes against impossible odds, to gather abstract resources and to utilize them to the betterment of entire communities. Yes, build businesses, but build them to bless the lives of millions. Open the doors so that the gospel can be sounded in every year, penetrate every climb, to bring all of the resources and elements mentioned above into the most impoverished countries and communities in the world. Brigham would go. Brigham would return. Brigham would not be afraid of finding a job. He would create a job. Brigham would not be afraid of his children not finding the best education. Brigham would educate them. Brigham would not be afraid of health care issues. Brigham would build a health care network that would service more than just his family. Brigham would not be afraid of corrupt governments. Brigham would reform them. Brigham would not only go himself, Brigham would lead the way. Brigham would pave the way for thousands of others to, to be able to lead the way as well. Brigham would go. This is the spirit that we need to install in each of our entrepreneurs. This is the fire to light in each member's soul. Abraham would go. Nephi would go. Brigham would go. 
Alfonso would go, Brigham would go. Let each member wear this, wear the slogan on his heart. Brigham would go. There's a power behind that, and there's a power behind the mission of this university. It's not a coincidence that, that each of us are here today in this time and in this place. This is not a, a, your typical university. This is a place where miracles happen, and I bet every one of you has a story of how you were brought here and how the Lord led you to this place. And we have the opportunity to gain an amazing education, something that other universities don't provide. There's a special spirit about this campus, and we have a special mission to go out and to do good in the world. And I believe with all my heart that entrepreneurship is one of those tools that we can use to build the kingdom of God in the earth. So don't get caught up in the craze of, of getting rich and this and that unless you're going to do it in the purpose to build the kingdom of God. Because I promise you that if you do, you will be successful. The Lord will bless you with the resources that you need to help build your communities, to go back to your hometowns and your home countries and build them. And... Uh, you know, I hope I hope that you can all do that. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Any uh, questions? I'll give that to you, Brother Tanner, if you want to email the students with that. I I always re refer back to that break and would go. Yeah, we'd appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. So, what's been your most success? What have you learned from your failures and and to provide you success for the future? Um, you know, I, 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 what have I learned from my failures? That it's just money and that it's just, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, I think is the biggest thing I've learned. You know, I had this, this deal that I've been doing for the last few years, a subdivision in Kahuku, and it's been a roller coaster. You know, because we got into it when the market was hot and we've had some real down times where we're so close to losing the project and, you know, lots of my money and other people's money that I've committed to is at stake. And I remember losing sleep over it and just stressing like, like, oh, just what's going to happen if it all goes away? And I remember there was one day that I just said, you know what? What happens if it really does? If I really lose everything today, does it really matter? You know, I still got my wife. I still have my kids. I still have my health, you know. And there's a lot of other people that have a lot worse challenges than I have, and especially if I lost everything. So I said, you know what? If I lose everything big deal, you know? Life goes on. I still got, got the things that are important in my life. And so that's probably been the greatest thing I've learned, that it really doesn't matter. And since then, I've really not stressed. You know, when I have a, uh, you know, I, I lose a deal or something doesn't go my way, you know, I just kind of will shrug my shoulders and move on to the next thing because I know that it's just temporary and it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. So that's the thing I'm going to the most probably. Oh. Right. Well, no, that, that's the best part is, is especially starting something as a student, you really don't have anything to lose, you know? And, and that's why, that was kind of my attitude when I started businesses in college is if it doesn't work, I, I don't lose anything. And if anything, I'm going to get a lot of education. You know, you can take these accounting classes and these entrepreneur classes, but by actually going out and doing it, you learn 10 times as much because you'll be able to apply those principles and, and see how they work, especially if you do them in school, you know? You can ask your professor, say, hey, I'm starting this business. Do you mind if I kind of tailor this assignment to my real life business. I'm sure they'll work with you. you know, I think it's a great opportunity. And plus you have a lot of resources and people that you can ask for help while you're here in school. It's, let's put it this way. It's a lot easier when you're a student to call up a, a, a somebody out there in the industry and ask for their advice or help because who's going to turn away a student? You know, If I call up somebody at a company in town and say, hey, I want to come tour your facility and kind of see how your business works, they're going to be like, now who are you again? You know, why, why are you going to come in? But as a student, you know, hey, I'm doing a research project on this. You know, I'm, I'm doing a business plan for a competition. Do you mind if I come see how your operation works? They're going to invite you in with open arms. They're going to love to help you. And you're going to get to see that operation firsthand where they're not going to love me and they're going to be afraid I'm going to be their competition, you know. So, yeah, make it happen. Don't be afraid. Just do it. Oh, 
I've been thinking about this. I always start a small business. Or yeah. About that. And taking classes at this time and having business at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm thinking this morning with all my classes, reading all the assignments, it's like, is the opportunity cost higher or lower to start my business now and don't do a lot of assignments or don't go right. as well as I would like to in school? So how, what do you advise? You know? You know, that, that's a great question, um, and that, that's a tough one because it is opportunity cost sometimes, and you just kind of weigh those out. It's kind of an individual decision. You've got to decide, you know, what you want to move forward with and what you have time to do because you can get so consumed in one thing that you don't let the other things in your life flourish, you know. You need to be dating and having fun and, and doing all those things too. And so it just depends on your time and what you can handle because for sure, if you start a business, depending on what it is, it can consume a lot of your time. Absolutely. So you, you make those judgment calls. But that doesn't stop you, maybe if you don't start it, you know, it doesn't stop you from researching and doing your homework assignments that are catered to that. You know, if you're taking an operations class, you know, how, does, how can I apply this to my business idea? You know, logistically, how would the business work? You know, if you're taking an accounting class, how can I do the books for this business? You know, that way you can kill two birds with one stone. So you may not start it, but if you have time, I'd say go for it. Yes. Um, when you were starting your businesses, especially here on campus, what ways did you find to finance those ventures? Um, you know, that kind of goes back to uh, that myth that you need financing. I've never been one to get financing. For the real estate deals, I've gotten financing. But all my other businesses, I've just bootstrapped. Let me give you an example. Uh, I, I told you I started that business called Luxury Motors when I was here on campus. And I didn't have any money. I was a poor student just like the rest of you guys. But I found out what the prices were at the auction. They were really cheap. It was only a couple hundred bucks. And so, and at the time, I think I was like a student aide or something, you know. Uh, and, and so I saved up a couple hundred bucks. And I went down and I bought my first car. Just bought one car. Thankfully, it didn't break down on me on the way home because I would have been out that 200 bucks. <laughs> but I got here on campus and I sold that car. Now, a lot of people would take that profit and they'd go spend it and then they're stuck. They only have one more car. I didn't, I, I didn't spend any of that money that I made. I put that aside and then I went down to the auction and when I had enough, I bought another car and I took the profit from that and eventually I could buy two cars and then three cars and then four cars. And I'll tell you what, it didn't take long by reinvesting that money, it didn't take long to where I was buying a ton of cars. I remember one semester, um, I went, I, bought, I think I bought like 25 cars in one week down at the auction, it was crazy. I was used to buying like four or five at a time, once, kind of when I got on my peak. But at the beginning of every semester, everybody needs a car. So I need to bump my inventory up. Bought 25 cars. And then I had another challenge. I had to get those cars here to Lot Ye to sell them. Okay, you don't just go down there with 25 buddies and drive 25 junker cars to the North Shore. Chances are stuff's going to break down. So have you guys seen those big semis that haul cars? You never see them with old junk cars. They're always with brand new nice cars from the dealership. And mostly you see them on the mainland. I rented one of those. Okay, Hired the driver. He came. We loaded up all these junk cars in this big semi. Drove here to campus. I parked right out here on Nanny Lowell Loop. You should have seen it. It was a sight to see. I mean, we're unloading these piece of crap cars <laughs> off this big semi. We drove them back by the Holleys, and I just lined them up. It was like a car dealership. I had my own little car lot back by Holley 3. Just had them all lined up there. And I just advertised like crazy that first week of school. Gave people killer deals. And i just meet them in the Aloha Center. I'd walk them out. All right, and here's the price range. Start low to high. Pick your car. Boom, here's the keys. Give me a check, and you're on your way. And so, but I would have never been able to do that if I just took the profits and I went out and spent them. So just start small and do it. Even when I started the cell phone store, I mean, I, we didn't have hardly any inventory. In fact, I bought, I bought used phones from um, Surplus here on campus. And I took them over here to Laie Shopping Center and I was selling those phones. I mean, we didn't have anything, but we bootstrapped it and we eventually got enough to where it would cash flow on its own. Now, that's not always the way to start. Sometimes you do need financing. But don't feel like you can't start a business without it. You gotta be creative and find ways to, to leverage what you have. And and some it's it's okay to start small, for sure. Yes. Yeah, it's good to um, start a business, but how about quality? How about what? Quality of service. Oh huge, 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 huge. You've gotta have quality of service, for sure. In fact, uh, I mean, you just got to bend over backwards to make sure that your, your customers and your clients are happy because without them, you don't have a business. And, and I don't care whether you have the very smallest business or, or the largest corporation in the country. If you don't have good service, you'll be out of business. The customer is always right. Even though a lot of times they're not, sometimes you have to, have to bite the bullet and make them happy even though that you know they're totally wrong or, or, they mess, or it's their mistake because without them, you have no business. 
you know, especially in the beginning with your businesses, that quality was suffering, like in your products or your inventory, like in the wireless. Like, how do you? Um, no, because I, I I tried to do it. I, I tried never to charge too much. You know, if it was a used phone, it was definitely discounted. And and I always tried. You know, the other thing is you got to be straight up with people about what you're selling them. You know, you got to full disclosure. You got to be like, and that that was the hardest thing about the car business. I would say, is because I was selling North Shore beater cruisers, and it doesn't matter. Just the fact that people are spending money on a car, they expect the world. Even though it real. That car could last a week, it could last 10 years. I have no idea, and there's no way to guarantee that. And so it is a challenge sometimes, but you just be clear with people, you know? And I think the other thing is when things do go wrong, uh, if you bend over backwards to try to come up with solutions, they see that, and they see that effort. You may not always be able to come up with the perfect solution, but I've had a lot of success in, in my business ventures of just caring about the problem. You know, when somebody has a problem, just the fact that I care and I try to find a solution goes a long ways. But again, you can't make everybody happy, and so sometimes you do have failures in that way. Yes? So when you say um, find your passion, does that mean like find something that you would like to start a business in or like something that interests you, or like find a passion in building businesses? Yeah, I, I think both. You know, my passion is in building businesses. Uh, I love all the businesses that I started, but I get bored very, very quickly with them. Like, you know, I, I'm over the cell phone store. If you guys want to buy that from me, just come get it. <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I, I love building stuff, but I'm not a great operator. You know, I don't know if you guys read that book, E-Myth, you know. I, I am definitely not the, the manager or the technician, you know. Um, you know, I, I'm just more of the entrepreneur. I like to build things. I like to come up with new ideas and build. And so I have a passion for that. Um, but I think some people, they might have a passion in the sciences. You know, I mean, doctor's offices are businesses, if you think about it. And so they need to pursue something that, like that that's going to make them happy. And the cool thing is I think entrepreneurship can apply across the board. You can use entrepreneurship in whatever field you go in. Even if you're within an organization, you can be an entrepreneur within another company. You know, finding solutions and building that. And so I, I guess the key would just be find what makes you happy. And, and there might be a lot of things that make you happy. But just don't do anything that you're just going to dread waking up to do in the morning. Like if I had to wake up and go run a company every day, I'd just go crazy. <laughs> it's better. For me, I like starting it and then putting the people in place to where it runs itself. For sure. Yes? You majored in business, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, how necessary do you feel that was in all of your business adventures? Do you feel it was necessary? I mean, it was advantageous that you did that? Or do you think you could have managed without it? Um, I think both, and I think the cool thing about what the school's doing now is that you can be a med another major, but you can take classes like this, and you can get an entrepreneur certificate even if you're a computer science major or elementary education. Is that right, Brother Tanner? Yep. And so, yeah, I don't think it hurts. If you really love a certain major, whatever it is, I'd say go for it, but I think you do need to take classes and build a network and gain some uh, business background um, for sure. Just maybe one or two more questions. Okay. If any. Yes. You also mentioned that don't let anything stand in your way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because uh, my sister and Tanner asked you a question about failures. Right. Like uh, you said, you shrug your shoulders and just go for another thing. Like, where do you determine the line? Like, uh, I keep going until this point before I think I should go for another thing. Um, yeah, that, that's a good that's a good point too. Like, I guess when you hit failures or you hit brick walls, you know, at some point it's a dead deal. It's not an opportunity anymore. And and so I think that just kind of it has to be your judgment call. At what point, you know, like with the car business, if if I didn't get that dealer's license in Alaska at that point, you know, maybe I would have had to just drop it and move on to something else. But I, I think it's worth doing a lot more research than just, you know, because if you just do a little bit of research on a business, you will run into brick walls. Otherwise, everybody would be doing that business. So you have to be creative. You've got to think outside the box and try to figure out some ways to make things work. I mean, that's the most successful entrepreneurs. That's how they've been successful is they've found a way to do something better, faster, or cheaper, right? They've had to be creative to do that. But sometimes it doesn't work out and you kind of hit enough brick walls that you realize maybe this isn't an opportunity. It's a good idea, but it may not be an opportunity. And so at that time, maybe it's time to move on to another venture or idea. Devin, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you.